Yeah. Good evening. We'd like to call the City Council meeting to order on yeah. Monday, June 2nd, 2014 at 7 o'clock p.m. Yeah. I certainly want to welcome all of you that are here with us this evening. If we could just take a moment of silent meditation, please. Thank you. We we'll ask Councilman Brown if he would lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. All Madam Clerk, could you call the roll, please? Mayor Bell. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Cole McFadden. Councilmember Brown. Here. Councilmember Davis. Here. Councilmember Moffitt. Present. And Councilmember Shaw. Here. Uh, we don't have any ceremonial items. Uh, we have one item that uh, we'll speak to after the clerk has gone through our priority items. I would ask first, are there announcements by the council? Recognize Councilman Davis. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I want to just to take a brief moment to talk about two people who are in their mid-90s uh, who've done some outstanding things here recently. Uh, one of them is a lady by the name of Hortense McClinton. Uh, a couple of Sundays ago, she was featured on the National Public Radio Program um, Morning Edition Sunday, and she had a delightful conversation with the host and talked about her rearing in Oklahoma, uh, her uh, education in, at Howard University, uh, and the fact that she was one of the pioneering uh, early African-American um, faculty members at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Um, she was very delightful, and those of you who would like to hear that uh, interview, I suggest that you go to the WUNC uh, website uh, or to the NPR website and uh, place her name in the search engine. The other person I want to chat about is uh, a gentleman that many of us know uh, from many years, um, Mr. R. Kelly Bryant. Uh, he was featured in yesterday's uh, Herald Sun talking about his uh, work with uh, Boy Scouts, uh, but he is much more comprehensive than that, and there will be a program at the Durham County Main Library on June the 21st um, talking about uh, how he has archived and documented uh, much of the life and, and, and times and events and people um, of Durham in general and the African American community in specific um, over the last 75 years. So Mr. R. Kelly Bryant will be honored at the Durham County Library on June the 21st at 3 o'clock. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Eddie, and I appreciate you bringing it again to our attention because all of us know these people are important as you indicated as a Howard grad, and she's a very faithful Howard alumni. So I appreciate the recognition, and we all know Kelly Bryant, and we're going to get his bridge lights on pretty soon. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, is that it? Okay, Approximate time frame. Oh, okay, good. Recognize Councilman Moffitt. On a, on a more pedestrian note, uh, I'm going to be absent from the first work session in July. On July, I think it's 20, uh, 24th, and then I would appreciate an excused absence. Second. It's been proper to move and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It, it passes six to zero. Recognize the mayor program. I'm going to be absent too, but it's on city business. I have a national committee meeting in St. Paul, Minnesota. Thank you. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes 6 to 0. I assume that's the same date, 20 July. Yeah, that's the same. Okay. All right, any other announcements by members of the council? If not, recognize the city manager for priority items. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, uh, Mayor, members of council. No priority items this evening. Likewise, 
Likewise, the city attorney. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. No priority items. And likewise, Madam City Clerk. Yes, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, I'd like to inform you that a supplemental item has been added to your agenda this evening, item 35, resolution memorializing Dr. Maya Angelo. Okay, well, you all have a, well, first of all, entertain the motion on the city clerk's priority I'll items. Move, it's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? You close the vote? It passes six to zero. Uh, we all have a copy of the resolution at, at our desk, and I, I won't read the complete resolution that uh, recognizes uh, Dr. Mario Angelo for all of her achievements. And I told the assistant clerk that I saw this evening that they are having a program for her tomorrow at Wake Forest University. So I don't know if we'll be able to get this uh, up there in time or not, but uh, we can check on that and see what happens. Thank you. The consent agenda items are items that may be approved with a single vote. Uh, if a council person or a member of the audience chooses to have the item removed, uh, we'll discuss that later in the program, and I'll just read, as usual, the heading of each one of the consent agenda items. <laughs> Item one is approval of city council minutes. <clears throat> Item two is street and infrastructure acceptances. Item three is Phillips Development and Realties, Re Realties Impact Fee Appeal. Item five is dedicated funding source performance audit dated March 2014. Item six are grants drawn down performance audit dated April 2014. Item seven is second amendment to 9th Street Infrastructure Project Development Agreement between, his, between the City of Durham and CPGPI Regency Development LLC. Item eight is proposed conveyance of approximately 0 .190 acres in fee simple to the North Carolina Department of Transportation at 753 Ellis Road, parcel number 156775, and 801 Ellis Road, parcel number 156779, Durham, North Carolina, 27703 for the East End Connector Project. Item nine is plan year 2014-2015 benefits recommendations. Item 10 is Historic Preservation Commission 2013 annual report. Item 11 is 2000. 13 Durham Open Space and Trails Commission Annual Report. Item 12 is 2013 Planning Commission Annual Report. Item 13 is 2013 Durham Board of Adjustment Annual Report. Item 14 is Durham Environmental Affairs Board 2013 Annual Report. Item 15 is 2013 Durham City County Appearance Commission Annual Report. Item 16 is Windmere Ridge Townhomes Category 4 Failed Development Reimbursement and Stormwater Facility Agreement. Item 17 is Contract Amendment for ST-254 Federal Road Buxton Riddle Project. Item 18 is City of Durham Telephone System Improvement Project. Item 19 is Execution of Amendment 3 with Lanier Parking Systems of Durham LLC for Parking Management Services. Item 20 is an item that can be found on the General Business Agenda. Item 21 is North Carolina Department of Transportation encroachment agreement for Irwin Road underpass lightning project. Item 22 is the water treatment plant residuals engineering services contract amendment number one. Item 23 is FY 2014 water reclamation facilities improvements engineering services contract. Item 24 is amendment number four for contract 4668. Andrew Avenue Elevated Storage Tank Design Contract Additional Construction Phase Services. Item 28 is Human Relations Commission Recommendations to Council on allegation, Allegations of Racial Bias and Racial Profiling by the Durham Police Department. Uh, that concludes the consent agenda items. I entertain a motion for approval so of consent agenda items. So moved. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Will you close the vote? It passes 6 to 0. Uh, the general business agenda, uh, item 20, Durham Traffic Separation Study, TSS. And I'm going to hold that. Uh, we have one person that wants to speak on that item. Uh, we're going to try to move to the uh, public hearings. But since we just have one person, why don't I entertain Dan Jewell, if you can come forth, Dan, quickly.
Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council for uh, hearing my brief comments tonight uh, here on behalf of and, and speaking uh, for the Durham Area Designers, of which I am president this year. Uh, we thank you for your, your diligence and deliberations on the uh, proposed Durham Traffic Separation Study and your consideration of the testimony presented to you by Durham Area Designers and other members of the community at the public hearing held last October. Uh, we know that you have a recommended resolution before you tonight that asks your consideration of that final report. Uh, we also know that you all will be thoughtful and wise in your deliberation of how best to deal with that report. Uh, it is still our very strong sentiment that it must be made clear with whatever you do that the uh, limited number of scenarios that were covered in the report are conceptual at best and uh, that they are not recommended solutions. Uh, we do contend that some of those solutions at key places will be potentially damaging for Durham in terms of city development and livability. Um, in the resolution, though, is a language that we strongly support, and that is that implementation will only be advanced uh, with project-specific studies and public engagement in collaboration with and approval by the city of Durham. Um, we know from experience that often when a long period of time passes between uh, when a report is completed and when implementation begins on those specific recommendations, uh, that those projects may not be subject to a robust re-examination and renewed community input. Uh, Durham Area Designers hope that it will be the council's intent that this will not occur in this study and rather we would endorse any actions by the city council and the manager to begin that process of project specific studies and good public engagement uh, as soon as feasible so is not to allow as time goes on uh, us forgetting about the important things in this in this report and to avoid potentially significant negative community impacts our Durham Area Designers team is ready and eager to insist, assist and support the City Council and the staff in any way that we can in this undertaking and process. Uh, thank you again for the time and your consideration of this matter. Thanks. Thank you. No questions. I entertain a motion on this item. Recognize Councilman Shule. And okay. Did Moffitt have here? I'll it's been proper to move and second discussion on the question. Just briefly, Mr. Mayor, uh, thank you so much. We had a long discussion about this, uh, reasonably long, I guess I would say, at uh, work session, and uh, we've discussed it in the past. Uh, I'm going to vote against this resolution uh, because I believe that we should not be accepting these recommendations. I know that there are many caveats, uh, which Dan Jewell mentioned, and I really appreciate your words and support them very much. Um, there are many caveats that these recommendations won't, won't be carried out until we have uh, detailed studies, but I think every time we accept these recommendations, which are not recommendations that our, fat, what, that our community generally supports, uh, then I think we, we give people more and more the idea that this is what's going to be happening, and I don't think we ought to be doing that. I would prefer that we uh, would just simply receive the report. Uh, I know after work sessions that's not the majority of the council, but I, I did want to say that. I just will give one example. The, the, this, this, this calls, for example, for the closing of Dillard Street. Uh, I don't think that there is a majority of our community or a majority of the council that will want Dillard Street closed, and certainly when the, we don't want people relying on that sort of thing in the future uh, by seeing this. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. Appreciate you. Let Welcome. me comment. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes. Miss, I'm sorry, okay. It fails 3 3. All right, that's, that's the motion. See? Let's move on. You see one who got, you see who got, you see. So what? Uh, let's move to E Town Hall constructions that I'll be given as Mitch. Should I move to, uh, to receive that? Oh, open to make a motion if you want I, to I move that we uh, receive the report. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Any further discussion on that motion? Hearing none, Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. 
It passes six to zero. Thank you. As many of you may know that uh, tonight is our budget public hearing, and this will be the second time that we are beginning a process called E-Town Hall meeting. Uh, we conducted our first e-town hall meeting to provide an opportunity for people who don't normally attend city council meetings a chance to weigh in on budget decisions and to interact with council members, city council members. Uh, these are very important decisions that determine how your tax dollars are spent on city services and programs. Uh, for residents at home, some of you have already submitted your questions via email, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, and we want to thank you for that. For those in the audience, uh, you may submit your questions on a on the blue card on the table that's near the clerk over to the left. Uh, the staff will collect the cards with your questions and give them to tonight's moderator. Uh, since this is a public this is a public hearing, for those of you who don't have a question but have a comment about the budget, you will still have an opportunity to comment following the E Town Hall meeting, uh, which hopefully will wrap up about 8:30. Uh, you simply complete the yellow card as usual if you have a comment for public hearings. Again, at the end of E-Town Hall, I will conduct the public hearing, which will be conducted as we normally do with public hearings. Uh, now I'd like to introduce and welcome tonight's moderator, Ken Smith, who is an anchor and reporter for WRAL-TV, and Ken will explain more about how E-Town Hall will work. Ken. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thanks for uh, being here tonight for the second E-Town Hall meeting. I'm Ken Smith with WREL TV and Fox 50. Joining me, uh, Mayor William Bell, Mayor Pro Tem Cora Cole McFadden, Council Members Eugene Brown, Don Moffitt, Eddie Davis, Steve Shule, Council Member Diane De Kakati, K Katari could not be with us tonight. City Manager Tom Bonfield presented the proposed 2014-15 budget to the City Council at the May 19th City Council meeting. After that, the City opened the cyber doors via email, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube to begin taking questions about what you'd like to see included in next year's budget. Tonight's E-Town Hall is part of the public hearing process to give you at home, as well as in the audience, a chance to get your questions answered. Over the past few weeks, the city has heard from several residents about what's proposed in this year's budget, from repaving streets to making repairs to parks and as well as fees that are charged for things like water. Now tonight we'll hear from city council members as they provide answers to your questions and hear your concerns before adopting the final budget on June 16th. As Durham and indeed the entire co uh, country slowly emerged from the recession, the city still faces challenges to ensure that there are enough revenues to cover expenses. In other words, making sure that there's enough money to pay for everything that the city needs. That's where you, city council, and the city administration work together to make those tough decisions to meet citywide needs. Now clearly, resources are limited. Now city council wants to hear and answer your questions and concerns to make sure resources are used the way you want them to be used. So that brings us to our first issue. And uh, before we ask that first question, we have a nine second video that we'd like to show you concerning the issue of sidewalks. Do you need a hand? All right, that video demonstrates the issue that we're about to talk about, which has to do with sidewalks. Now, uh, this question reads, I and my family have tripped many times on the unsafe and badly broken sidewalks, which are in desperate need of repair in front of our home. There's also no way that uh, handicapped people in wheelchairs or in crutches or in walkers can get down our street because the sidewalk is in pieces. I asked the City Council to increase funds to repair sidewalks more quickly. I hope the City Council agrees that waiting years to repair this and provide safe access is too long and that something must be done to repair our sidewalks. Now, how can we get a sidewalk along the edge of Eno Trace between Shadebush and Lazy River on Infinity Road built? Is there money set aside to increase the number of sidewalks in the Durham area in general? Mr. Moffat, get us started, if you will. Well, not to be glib, there's never enough money. Um, we have um, 
along with sidewalks, of course, there's, uh, you can point to uh, streets and street paving, new sidewalk construction, new street paving, just in those two areas right there. There's a lot of need. And um, as you started out by saying, it's, it's um, <clears throat> the hardest task that we have as a council is to balance the services that the city provides with the revenues that we raise. And nobody wants to see their taxes go up and nobody wants services cut. So we're always looking for how to balance that. Right now we have $100,000 in the budget for sidewalk repair, but it, it, it wouldn't even begin to cover all of the sidewalks in the city. It's gonna take a long time for us to get the, the city into a, a place where people don't find problems with the sidewalks on a regular basis. And interestingly enough that you mentioned the $100,000 because the, the uh, email also um, mentions the $100,000 set aside. Um, they're asking to increase that to $200,000 a year, and you mentioned, you know, funds are limited. Can that happen? There are a couple of ways that that could happen. Um, there is, uh, I don't know how much uh, extra we have in the fund balance. Uh, right now, I'd have to look to our finance director for that number, but um, as a one-time expense, one time, we can't do on, in, um, ongoing expenses from the general fund, the unreserved balance. But we could look there. But we certainly have a number of demands on, that are similar to that, a, a number of requests of uh, people asking for things that are important to them. Um, we could also do it by raising taxes, and we can do it by cutting other services. Um, but those are just broad stroke, um, very difficult to actually go in and there's no spare $100,000 in the budget right now. I mean, every dollar is accounted for. Thank you, Mr. Moffitt. We appreciate it. Our next topic, uh, streets. Um, we move from sidewalks to streets. Bumpy streets, this uh, email reads, are still an issue in Durham. How is the city addressing the need to fix bumpy streets and potholes in the city? Mayor Bell. Well, there, there is a number that uh, people can call. It's 560-1200. And we know that there are many potholes throughout the city. Uh, we try to address them as soon as possible when they're identified. And I would suggest if you know of a street that has a pothole or you consider it to be bumpy, if you would call that number, then someone will be able to address it in terms of being able to take care of it. Anyway, and uh, council members, feel free to jump in on any of these topics, if you will. Uh, when I call out uh, the mayor or any other council members, it's just to give them an opportunity to get the conversation started, but feel free to jump in any time. All right. Yes. Mr. Brown. Yes, thank you. Uh, let me add a couple of points. One, uh, and picking up, too, on what my, my colleague said, every budget session, uh, I, I, I tend to remind us, and they know this, that we, you begin with the premise in city government that we have more needs than revenues. It's very simple. More needs than revenues. Every budget, budget session, and I've been here for 10 now, uh, so then the question becomes, and it's, it is, as Don says, a very difficult one, one of priorities. Where do you place your priorities? Um, so that's our challenge. Um, secondly, getting back to the question about roads, mm -hmm. and this is unfortunately what the public uh, does not understand quite often, and that is we have both city roads and it's almost a euphemism now to say state maintained roads. I say state roads <laughs> because they're not very well maintained by our state, um, even though that's their responsibility and not ours. And they are the main streets. And quite often that's where we get most of the, uh, uh, the protest calls uh, concerning bumpy streets or potholes or whatever. Uh, not always. Some of them are ours. There's no question about that. But the public sees a street as a street, doesn't see it as a city street versus a, a state street. So that adds to the complexity of the issue. And then my last point is sidewalks. 
And I think we are sidewalk poor in Durham. There's a deficiency here. And I'm just going to confess part of this is, is my responsibility because when we passed the, I think it was a $20 million street uh, improvement, uh, what, four years ago, three years ago? Uh, what we should have done at the time, and it's always easier, of course, to look back, but we should have designated a certain percentage of that street bond for sidewalks, 5%, 10% or whatever. We didn't do that. And we would have been better off now if we would have done that because sidewalks connect neighborhoods, they connect people. Walkability is one of the, the key things that people are looking for now, much more so than they were even certainly 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. So, thanks. Thank you. Mr. Brown, thank you. And that actually leads us to our next issue in terms of people getting around, and it has to do with traffic safety improvements and more specifically bike lanes. This email comes to us um, and says, my primary objective is to add one more voice to requests for more adequate funding for traffic safety improvements for pedestrians and cyclists. As a family, we conduct the majority of our errands by bicycle, which in, is indeed possible in Durham. Now, those locations where adequate infrastructure like sidewalks and traffic lights is, are absent, bike riding with children can become life-threatening in, in any case. Now, basically, here's what this uh, emailer wants to know. There are critical gaps between sidewalks, as you just mentioned, Mr. Brown, uh, critical gaps between ramps, missing pedestrian lights, and lights that do not switch automatically. How do we solve this problem in the budget? Can funding for other seemingly less important areas be reduced? And I might point out that this email says, for example, in terms of taking away money from the public affairs government television, on which we're broadcasting tonight. I'm not sure how much possible that is, but question being, is there money in the budget? Can we make that happen, Mr. Brown? I'm coming at you again. I think we, we've made uh, some progress uh, with bike lanes, uh, and certainly part of our focus, too, uh, has been on trails, like the American Tobacco Trail, the bridge going over I-40, and so on. Uh, we've made progress on Main Street in front of East Campus, where that entire area was redone, and it took almost a year to do it, but now there's a designated bike trail. Uh, Cameron Road, Maureen Road, Hill and Dale, plans are underway to, to see what can be done on those three main arteries. Uh, but again, I, you know, state versus local streets, uh, we can't simply demand that a bike lane be added to a st state street. I mean, that, then you got to go to the General Assembly and go to the Department of Transportation, and you might as well be dealing with the Pentagon. Um, it, it's very, very difficult. Do we need to do more? Yes. Uh, are we doing more? Yes. Is, is it enough? Probably not. Yeah. So it should rise, I hope, mm -hmm. with all my colleagues uh, to a higher scale of You know, it's priority. interesting you should say that because um, a lot of neighbors look at the street and say, hey, this is a Durham street. But in actuality, some of the streets aren't Durham streets. They're state streets. And like you just pointed out, um, there are protocols to follow in terms of bringing bike lanes to state streets. Yes. You learn, Ken, something Ken, at, Ken, you learn something at these Ken, meetings all the time. Ken, mm -hmm. let, let me just add to uh, Councilman Brown's comments. And I, I've been reminded that in terms of what the city is doing locally and trying to maintain its own streets, we did increase our budget from $750,000 to a million dollars in terms of street resurfacing and paving. So that's another piece that the city has taken, undertaken to try to meet, meet that, that effort. Right. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Brown. Thank you, too. Uh, public safety. Um, this emailer is concerned about the press, the media, 
um, reported an increase in crime this year, according to the police department. It is mostly, quote, retaliatory crime, and not related to other crime. When I have a conversation with staff and neighborhood improvement services, we agree that blighted properties often lead to negative outcomes pertaining to public safety. With that in mind, does the amount of property tax allocated for public safety need to be increased to keep the city safe? Mayor Bell. Well, public safety is, is a combination of not just police department, but fire department, et cetera. But I assume that people are focusing more on the police department. Uh, presently, our police department is staffed at its level that's required that they're asking for in terms of sworn officers. So in terms of the number of police, uh, that are sworn officers on the staff, uh, we're at the level, and we're funding them at that level. Uh, can you always use more money? Sure, you can. Uh, but in terms of trying to improve, improve public safety, uh, I constantly remind others that it's not just a law enforcement piece alone. Uh, it has to have a community involvement, and we're trying to include that as a part of the effort as we try to increase public safety. But specifically, uh, we're funding the police department in terms of sworn officers at the level that they've requested. As council members, and, and as you make your way through many of the Durham communities, are you finding that neighbors are getting more involved in terms of keeping their neighborhoods safe? Well, I, let me say this. It's interesting to raise that, that question, because um, I just participated, as did a number of my council members this past weekend, at a town hall meeting in Northeast Central Durham. And after that meeting was concluded, uh, I just happened to walk out and I saw some person sitting on their porch. And I went over and introduced myself to them to try to get a sense of uh, how they felt the neighborhood. And this was on uh, Drive Avenue. And asked them, uh, did they feel more comfortable in the neighborhood? Uh, did they see some improvements? And to a person, there were about six persons sitting on the porch. And I said, the fact that you're sitting on your porch says something to me. She said, you're right, because uh, maybe a year or so ago, we wouldn't have been sitting here. But their answer is, yes, they, they do find that uh, getting involved uh, can make a difference. In fact, after we finished the conversation, uh, we took them back across the street to the town hall meeting to introduce them to some of the leaders to make sure that they were a part of the group that's going to be involved. So I, I think community involvement plays a big part and uh, will continue to play a big part in terms of improving public safety in our neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. Ms. McFadden, you... Uh... Yeah, and I know that Neighborhood Improvement Services will be uh, promoting, uh, bringing more citizens into our PACs, mm -hmm. but that's because that's where a lot of our preventive activity is held. Uh, this is something that I believe Ms. Stancil said at one of our recent meetings. Mm. Is it Davis? Mr. Smith, thank you. Um, I, I... As a new member of the council, I've been very impressed with the number of neighborhood groups uh, that have invited me and my colleagues to different events that they've held, uh, which show that people are rallying around their own neighborhoods and, the, and the multiple neighborhoods in Durham. So I think to answer, help to answer your question, uh, yes, many more people are doing that, and that is during the spring. I expect that there will be even more such activities as we go through the summer leading into and up to the National Night Out program that will be held in August. Okay. All right. Thank you. Appreciate that. Solid waste, the possibility of a reduction of recycling due to uh, position elimination, of course, eliminating positions or jobs. This email comes in to us. Now that the waste reduction coordinator position has been eliminated, how does the city intend to coordinate local government agencies and community groups who are working on positive impact waste reduction initiatives in Durham? And now that the environmental economic evidence base demonstrates that waste reduction pays for itself, how does the city justify removing the waste reduction coordinated position as a budget cut? Mr. Davis. Well, we, we listened to the um, proposal that came from the um, Solid Waste Department and talked about the, that reduction of that position. Uh, I think we are looking very closely at the idea that there will be many more groups, voluntary groups, as well as agencies that will be working uh, proactively to try to make sure that there is a, a heavier emphasis on um, uh, recycling and that we can indeed uh, in, uh, absorb the, the reduction of that position 
about having many more people in a community action me method uh, to try to make sure that we indeed do involve more people. Um, and also that there will be many more efficiencies within the solid waste department that will allow for uh, that work to be done by others in the department. And of course, neighbors will have a suggestion on how you can work this out. And, and this email says, why not reduce 401k for employees rather than eliminate positions in solid waste? Well, I, I think that certainly would, would be many ways that we could do things. We could reduce salaries. I mean, we don't, certainly don't want to go in that direction. Um, we certainly want to be a good employer. Uh, we want to make sure that we give our employees the same kinds of wages and benefits uh, that they would obtain if they were in the private uh, sector. And we certainly want to make sure that these benefits uh, are there um, for them as they do the great work that they do for the city of Durham. And one more note about um, solid waste. Um, this email wants, emailer wants to know, uh, can you clarify what it means for code enforcement to be done on, quote, react, on a reactive basis? Um, well, I just had a conversation with the city manager as we came in, um, and, and we have been looking at trying to make sure that we uh, um, look at different neighborhoods and different ways that we might be able to enforce the codes. Uh, we're hoping that we can have a proactive method that might include Keep Durham, a, keep Durham Beautiful and other uh, agencies and neighborhoods to see if we can be more proactive uh, rather than reactive so that that code enforcement will come from the eyes and ears that we will have uh, throughout the community um, from different agencies and communities. All right, Ms. Davis, thank you. Parks and recreation is the next topic. And of course, uh, I want to point out the half cent on the tax rate was discussed at a budget meeting last week to support maintenance issues and repairs at city parks and facilities. To that end, this email comes in to us and uh, it, it reads, I am writing in support of increased funding for city parks maintenance in this year's budget, even if it means a tax increase to pay for it. I would also like to express my support for the development of a multi-field sports complex for sports such as soccer and lacrosse. This lack of fields not only costs Durham visitors dollars, it also results in the overuse of both city fields and Durham public schools fields. Please address this issue. Mr. Shul. Thank you very much for the question. It's a great question. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, it's always nice to uh, get support for something that the council's planning to do. So uh, it's great to get that, get that email. Um, I would say a couple of things about parks in this budget. First of all, there are two ways in which I think we're really going to improve what we see in our parks. And the first is uh, that uh, we haven't passed this yet, but there's a lot of support on the council for adding a half cent, or about $1.2 million, in funding parks and recreation to address uh, park and, parks and trail maintenance. And this would be allocated towards hiring staff who would, who would mow, who would fix all the little broken fences, who would paint all the basketball goals that are unpainted, who would uh, fi fix up the, 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 uh, the, the every, all the many, many broken things in our parks, resurface fields, uh, make fields green that are brown and don't have any grass anymore, all the kinds of maintenance that we need so badly in our parks. Uh, we have, uh, I believe now, 58 parks in Durham, and it just is a tremendous job to keep them well maintained. The same way, it's an infrastructure question. The same way we need to maintain the infrastructure of our streets and our sidewalks, the same is true of our parks. We have thousands of people using our parks and they've got, to be, they've got to be in great shape. The other way in which I think it's, we're really uh, including some really good things for our parks in this budget, Ken, is through our um, capital improvement plan. We have about $4 million uh, earmarked for parks in this plan, and there are things that people have been wanting, uh, in some cases, for a long time, and then some just important needs that we have. For example, uh, we need to, um, the Americans for Disability Act calls for us to comply with certain things in parks in terms of, of access and so forth. And so we're going to be spending about $350,000 this year in Valley Springs and West Point on the Eno for that kind of thing. If you've ever been to Twin Lakes Soccer Park, which is one field, it's, it's, it's an it's a AstroTurf field, 
it is rented 362 days a year. That's how popular this park is. And of course, it's been played into oblivion. The surface is no good. There's problems with the fence. And this, we have $400,000 in the budget to resurface that field so we can keep it playable. We've got $1.5 million for West uh, Ellerby Creek Trail, which is a really important trail in West Durham that many people want. Uh, we have so much in the budget for parks. $900,000 for resurfacing Herndon, Her, resurfacing Herndon Park, which will make that park playable many more days of the year. Mm -hmm. So we're doing a lot for parks. In terms of the athletic complex, yeah. I'm in favor of an athletic complex, and I think many of us would love to see it. I think we need a park another park besides Herndon Park south of I-40 where everything's happening and growth. But my colleague, Gene Brown, and the mayor and Don have all talked about the fact that there are trade-offs all the time. So what we're doing first with parks is we're renovating and fixing up what we've got, and hopefully we'll be able to do some of the new things in the future. Mm -hmm. and, and staying with the whole idea of infrastructure, this next email comes, uh, comes to us about uh, pools around uh, the community, and we should point out that there is a pool study going around underway um, that examines the placement of pools throughout the city. And this emailer wants to know, uh, is there funding for Walltown, a Walltown swimming pool? So, yeah, thank you for that question as well. Great question. We do have a swimming pool study that's going on now. I think, I think many of the people in the public know that Longmeadow Park Pool is closed for this summer because of maintenance issues. Uh, it's a dangerous situation with water in the, uh, in the electrical room there. And so um, we've got a swimming pool study going on. It's going to take into consideration all the locations of our pools. A new pool is very expensive. It's going to cost $10 million. So again, it's not something to be undertaken lightly, but we're going to study where, uh, where pools are needed. We're going to study what we need to do to make sure that our existing pools are well-maintained. Uh, and, and we'll be able to, uh, I think when that park study comes, we'll be able to give a, a pool study comes, we'll be able to give a better answer. All right, sure, thanks. Uh, planning, that's the next issue we're talking let, about. Let me, uh, again. Ah, yeah, yes, if, Rob, if I may ahead. add to that, because my, my colleague pointed out a good point in terms of the Long Meadow Pool. I think that's really tragic that that's not going to be open this swimming season. Of all the places in Durham that really need a public pool, that's one of them. Um, and I don't think we're going to have a pool realistically at Walltown. We just spent close to $10 million there on the facility. I'd like to see it utilized more often than it is. But we need to take care, first and foremost, of what we already have. And pools are very expensive, and that long metal pool is absolutely crucial for the young people of Durham, particularly those in northeast central Durham. And the reason it's not going to be viable this, this summer? Well, we've, believe it or not, we've spent a lot of money there. It's, it's a question of uh, hydrostatic water coming in through the walls into the electrical room, which is located below ground. Uh, we now have an, yet another analysis looking into it. Uh, but uh, it, it needs attention mm. in terms of the safety of the workers who, yeah. who are there. And I'm really sorry that we could not at least go one more summer mm. uh, using that pool. But well, um, I've got to tell you, um, when it comes to pools and electrical situations, we've done a number of stories in the last month of, of children being electrocuted or almost electrocuted as a result of, of electrical wirings around pools. So um, that is a concern and uh, that, that should be um, taken care of before anything happens. All right, planning. And this has to do with staffing. Um, how does a citizen ensure their planning needs are prioritized in the planning work plan? I have been waiting over three years for a study to be done on my neighborhood's local historic district designation. Each year it is not included because there's not enough staff, but the planning department feels they don't need any extra staff. Help me understand in bold. Mr. Moffat. Chair, 
So one of the things that we do, we're a very democratic city, and um, people can come to our council meetings. It doesn't matter if an item's on for a public hearing or not. If someone wants to speak on it, they can sign up to speak. And, um, if, and w it's a very open city. And one of the things that we do is we, we say, look, if you want something, and if you want a sidewalk, if you want a street paved, you can do a petition and then uh, bring it to us and we'll make it happen. And, and the answer is yes, that's gonna happen, but it's n probably not gonna happen as quickly as you think it will. And um, we have a long list of sidewalks, we have a long list of streets that people have requested. And we also have two local historic districts that people have requested that um, be developed and brought to council uh, for consideration. Uh, one of those is in the Cleveland Holloway area, the other one is in the Golden Belt area. The Cleveland Holloway one, the staff has told us that they believe that they will have that to council within the next 12 months. And of course, one of their challenges is that they need to bring, what we want them to do is to bring us a plan that has broad community support. And that's not as simple as simply drawing boundaries. Um, there's a, and, uh, this, the second thing that's going on that they're working on in that area of the planning department is that, there, that there's districts all over the city, but each one has slightly different rules. So they're trying to do a consolidated set of rules so that, that um, it's simplified uh, for the staff, for the Historic Preservation Commission, and for the districts themselves, it's easier to understand. And so they're, they're trying to get these rules finished, then bring Cleveland Holloway forward, and then work on Golden Belt. And um, we're looking at that. We're trying to figure out if there's a way that we can help uh, on a one-time basis to move these two historic districts uh, to completion this year, and we're going to do our best. So to this uh, emailist point, there is adequate staff. Uh, it, it's like everything else. Um, the, uh, the, the, the planning department has a very long list of things that they want to accomplish that we want them to accomplish. And so they don't have enough staff. It's what uh, my colleague, uh, Councilman Brown, was saying at the beginning. There's always more needs than there is the funding to pay for those needs. The question is always, where down that list do we stop this year, and how much are we going to spend to get to that point? And so uh, they have enough st So you, if we look at them, we divide them into the critical issues and the important issues. Um, they have enough to deal with the critical issues and hopefully some of the important issues, but not enough to get everything on the list done this year. Right. Ms. McFadden, please in the, proceed. In defense of um, planning, um, a lot of what happens, and, and I do believe, I understand that he does have adequate staff because he said it over and over. There is a layer of decision making in the whole process, I think, that holds, holds up progress and staff has to spend an inordinate amount of time on that layer, and that's something that I'm hoping the city and county managers will be talking about very soon. I'm not gonna call the name of that layer, I'm on it. All right, thank you, Ms. McFadden. <laughs> Appreciate sure. that. <laughs> All right, uh, Mayor Bell, you've made it known uh, about your uh, poverty initiative, and uh, this emailer wants to know, they understand the need to address poverty throughout the city. How is the city funding that initiative? I can assume that the writer is speaking about the joint effort between the city council, Durham Board of County Commissioners, and the Durham Public Schools to reduce poverty neighborhood by neighborhood, year by year, starting in 2014. And we, we started this process uh, first by saying we aren't speaking about adding more money to what's already being spent. I'm not saying that somewhere down the line those things might change, but it isn't a matter of trying to find more dollars. It's trying to make more effective use of the dollars that we're already putting into those areas. And towards that end, we've defined six areas that we're focusing on, health, education, public safety, housing, jobs, and finance. Uh, some of those are under the purview of the city, some under the purview of the county, and some under the purview of the Durham Public Schools. So let me speak specifically to, to the city schools, I mean to the city council. Uh, public safety, housing, and to a certain extent, jobs are pretty much what the city council is involved in. And to that end, what we're trying to do is to focus on those areas uh, through task force to come up with ways we can improve that. In terms of poverty in general, uh, we are really focused on those areas already. I mean, if you look at what's happening in certain parts of our city in terms of housing, 
if you look at the fact that we're spending a lot of time focusing on crime in those neighborhoods that have experienced larger disease of crime than others, we're doing that. If you look at housing, our neighborhood improvement services is working to deal with court enforcement to make sure we have houses that's meeting, meeting the codes of our city. So we're doing those things, all those things, to me, are underlying issues related to poverty. But specifically, we've chosen a particular part of the city, Northeast Central Durham, a particular section of Northeast Central Durham, that we are beginning to focus on on this program of reducing poverty neighborhood by neighborhood, year by year, 2014, and we'll be defining the neighborhoods that we're working in. Because what happens there can be a blueprint for what you can do elsewhere. Exactly, and that, that's what we're hoping. And what, what I've said over and over again, even though we're focusing on these specific neighbor, neighborhoods, it doesn't mean that other neighborhoods might benefit from some of the things that we find out that will spill over into other neighborhoods. So while we focus on these neighborhoods, it doesn't mean that uh, the boundary line says that other neighborhoods couldn't be doing some of the same things that we are, are going to be coming up with. But this is a long-term project, King, and I, I think it's important for people to realize that. Sure, and, and if I may, uh, this email had talked about funding, but it isn't always about funding when it comes to reducing poverty, is it? It is not. It is not. Uh, it, you know, if, if we spoke spe specifically about poverty and that relates to income, the easy way to fix it is go out and find all the people that are in poverty, that below incomes, find money, give it to them, and take them out of poverty. But that isn't the solution. Uh, the underlying causes which contribute to poverty are the things that we're looking at and trying to focus on. In some cases, it may mean more money, but we aren't starting off with the premises that we're going to put more money in. We're first going to try to find out how can we improve those areas. And changing the mindset. Uh, this next topic is... Ken, um, can I make a comment on ah, that as well? Mr. Shul, feel Thank free. Thank you. I just wanted to say uh, the mayor has modestly said that that this is an initiative of the of the city council and the county commission and school board. In in, in a sense, it is, but I think we uh, I, I feel that the community owes him a, a debt of gratitude for putting this on the front burner. I think we all know that Durham is making incredible strides in many ways, but we also know and we've all known that there are a lot of people in Durham who do not share in that. And I think what the mayor has done is to say that to the whole city in his state of the city speech. He has rallied the troops. He's gotten the committees established. He's gotten our city staff involved. Uh, there's a process going on. Uh, people are coming to our committees. They're rallying to it. Uh, and I just want to say, you know, I've, I've seen other big projects that uh, the mayor has, uh, has started and, you know, he, he pushed a difficult, risky ones to merge our, our city and county schools, which we did successfully, and it was hard. Uh, the, the risk of, of building the DPAC, um, the South Side neighborhood, which I think is going to end up being a tremendous success, and all these are risks, uh, and I think that, uh, that the mayor has led. And I don't, I, I, while I appreciate his modesty on this, I think putting this in the foreground, putting this in the forefront of what we're trying to do here in Durham in a way that's in everybody's consciousness that we're going to try to fight poverty here in Durham and that we have a strategy to do it, it isn't going to all work out perfectly. You know, we've got kind of an unwieldy structure and who knows how it's all going to go. But I can tell you that having it in the forefront of everybody's mind has already, I think, made a difference in the way people are thinking about focusing their resources. And so I just want to thank you, Mr. Mayor. and. Uh, Say, so I think it's already making a big difference. Thank you, Mr. Shul. Ken, I'm going to add to that too, very briefly, which is that um, I want to just sort of describe for a moment so that people understand it's not just people getting together and talking about this. But uh, of these six task forces, some of these are, um, I, for example, uh, I, I work on the health task force, and I, I know the least among everybody who's on that, but um, they come together. And, th and they've been working, like there's partnership for Healthy Durham. So we're, we're looking at it, we're trying to look at it in a different way. And to say, what, what, is there some kind of disruptive technology, if you will? Something that we can, that's low cost, it's replicable, that um, uh, we can replicate it across the city and that um, it's scalable. But uh, other of these task forces um, are people who are coming together for the first time and really beginning to think about h how to deliver uh, services in a different way. And so it's very exciting to me to, to see what's going on. And when we started this, I didn't really know where we were going. We still don't. It's one of our models is to embrace ambiguity. And, um, but uh, like uh, Councilman Schul said, you know, I, I have the debt of gratitude and excitement about the, um, the discussions that are occurring already. 
Smuffer, thanks. Well, you know, I always so have to say something great about this <laughs> great mayor. But one of the things that I'm excited about is the opportunity that this initiative will give us to actually to uncover and to uh, confront the institutions that drive poverty mm. um, in our community. Um, and the same goes with, with homelessness. There are institutions, policies, practices that cause us to be where we are. And we need, when we see them, we need to make sure that we try to do something to eradicate them. Uh, thanks, Ms. McFadden, because I'm coming to you next. Because this issue is really important to me as well, because um, I do a lot of volunteer work um, with our church after school program. So I recognize the importance of what we do to ensure that our children have choices. Um, because I don't advocate, like, just educate our children, but I really believe that what we do puts our children in a position to have choices and make those choices. What opportunities, this emailer wants to know, um, what opportunities are out there that the city might be providing to engage our youth? And this one I'm very proud of. Uh, the establishment of our youth commission almost 10 years ago, let's see, 10 years ago, to advise us as elected officials on those kinds of issues that uh, youth see as being important to them. So we have in place a group of young people who can actually share with us what they see as our needs. Now, they were sort of quiet this past fiscal year. <laughs> so we've got to pump them up mm -hmm. this coming mm -hmm. fiscal year because I know we have some vivacious youth coming on our youth council this year. But they, and as I look in the audience, uh, I don't see any, maybe there are some, hmm, I don't mm -hmm. see any youth uh, in the audience. And that's sort of typical mm -hmm. of what we see throughout the community. And I think that's why uh, we probably lose so many youth mm. uh, because they are not involved yes. uh, in their own planning. Uh, the, the other thing I know that we have that uh, is probably most popular is the uh, summer youth program. Summer youth mm -hmm. employment mm -hmm. program. Uh, I think we received over 1,700 applicants. Um, this year, and uh, we've interviewed, I know, close to 500 um, applicants, and um, they will be placed in parks and rec, some throughout City mm -hmm. Hall, uh, and with employers throughout the city. Now, what we need to do, and I will make this call, is to ask employers throughout the community to either hire or contribute money to the city so that we can hire our young people in, in positions. We cannot force employers to hire, but those of you who shop wherever can ask uh, your merchants, do you hire young people? And if the answer is yes, keep shopping with them. Mm -hmm. uh, if it is no, uh, that will give you a few options, but anyway, uh, it's very important that that we uh, shop with people who really care about uh, our youth. I always find that because I do uh, so much work with young people that it's so important to make sure that they are vested mm -hmm. um, in, in the process. How can we encourage them to become vested in the process because we will try to pave the way but how do we get them involved how do we get them sitting out here how do we get them knocking on those doors to find those jobs how do we get them involved in the process well they are already involved they're just not here tonight mm. but uh, I, I do know that um, they've been involved in the interview process they're aware of the jobs and so they will be doing that. I am the advisor to our youth commission, so in the upcoming year, I will 
as I said, do whatever I can uh, within my role as city council, not overstepping that boundary mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that they are pumped up and ready for action. What we tried to do is recruit young people who are actually, who actually want to do some work mm -hmm. and who will question us on stances that we take. And I know at least three that I've recruited who are just waiting for the opportunity to come before us and, and make their demands known. An example, mm -hmm. please time me. Yeah, okay. An example is a couple of years, a few years ago, they said they wanted a teen center. And so we do have a teen center. That teen center is right across the street from the Lion Park Community Life Center. And I just hope that more teenagers um, in the ages, well, grades nine through 12, will participate in that uh, facility. It is awesome, they planned it, and they have some good programs going on there. An example of teens and young people getting vested in, mm -hmm. in, in the process. Mm -hmm. Mr. Fadden, thank you. Uh, I, I gotta tell you that um, downtown Durham has come a long way. I moved here in 2000 and um, working for Capital Broadcasting, and I, I gotta admit, I rarely came to Durham, but now I look forward to coming to Durham, in, in all honesty, uh, because not only there are things to do, the DPAC and whatever else, but you've got a great food restaurant scene in Durham that I really like. Uh, Mayor, talk to us about downtown development and what's on the horizon. Yeah, and you, you, you said it all, and I'm gonna share this uh, with my other colleagues on the council in response to this. Uh, it's no question that uh, we've made great progress in downtown re re revitalization. It's been through public-private partnerships uh, that has made this happen, but I'm going to turn this over to Councilman Brown and let him further elaborate on this. Mr. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> Well, I guess I, I can speak as a, a native of Durham, and uh, growing up here, uh, downtown, believe it or not, used to be called the city of exciting stores, <laughs> the city of exciting stores, and, and people would come here from the entire area to shop. Obviously, that uh, is no longer the case, but when I moved back to Durham after a 15-year hiatus period, um, it, uh, downtown Durham was more than just a sleepy town. It was, at night too, it was a place to, to almost be avoided. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the goals that we recognized up front was that to breathe life back into any urban area, into a downtown area, you need citizens to live there. and. So that is what is happening, and we're, we're very pleased to see that going on. Um, the, uh, I think part of the question, too, related to, to parking, and will, will there be adequate parking for those who visit downtown? I think that's an exciting question <laughs> to even ponder as one who has seen the transformation of this city and especially our downtown. Uh, there are hotels going up. I think know. I see here four new hotels. Yeah, and uh, by you know, our, our planning rules and regulations, we require adequate parking for the guests. The vast majority of those will be overnight parking, so they will not necessarily interfere with people who want to come to downtown during the day and for, for esteemed dining experience as well as Deepak and the Durham Bulls list can be expanded. So I really don't see this, you know, in some ways I hope it does become a problem four <laughs> or five years down the road, but uh, I don't see that now as, as a, a major problem. Uh, we're just ex exceedingly excited about seeing what's going on here. Mm. And I, I know for citizens, me being a citizen, um, parking is always an issue. And, and I'm always um, concerned when 
the issues are focused on our visitors, which is fine, you know, parking for the hotels and whatnot, but for everyday citizens coming downtown, being able to partake in the restaurant scene, uh, the parking for them, um, what about that? Which, you know, could be a problem. It well, they, they may have to, uh, to walk a block or two, mm -hmm. and there's certainly nothing wrong with that. Um, but see, this really goes back to the crux of the matter in terms of what we have done here, as the mayor alluded to, with our public-private partnerships. Because if you're out in suburbia and you're building a parking space on open area, flat ground, that space will probably cost you anywhere from $2,500 up to $3,500. Uh, but in downtown, where land is scarce, uh, you're going to pay four or five times more for that parking. So that's one of the, the driving elements of why we had these, the partnerships that we had to have. I mean, parking is no question about it. It's absolutely mm -hmm. crucial. Yeah. Um, but I think we are addressing that issue. And again, I don't want to be redundant, but it's a great problem to have as someone, as a native of Durham, and who's seen the positive transformation. Can, Brown, can, thank you. Oh, uh, Mr. Yeah. Shul and then Mr. Moffat. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted to add one, one, one thing to that, which is that I think one of the things we want to do, and these are questions that you alluded to earlier, one of the ways we reduce the need for parking downtown is to increase the walkability of downtown uh, and so that uh, and and increase our bike lanes and our improve our trails and ha add more trails so that people are coming to downtown in other ways and are traveling through downtown in other ways um, and I think that we're going to be doing that uh, we we have a we have a for example the belt line is a railroad line that Norfolk Southern owns that goes through downtown Durham and we have long coveted that as a possible trail it's no longer used as a railroad line uh, and there's a lot of work in the city, both on the part of the government, our city government, and the part of, of uh, private interests to try to figure out a way to make that happen. All those things can cut down on the need for parking. And then the other thing about parking is this. It goes back to, you know, so, so the, the theme seems to me to be kind of the same in, in a lot of these questions, which is there are a lot of things we want, but we also don't really want to pay more. And so that's where this is constantly negotiated and several of my colleagues have, have referred to this but we got to have unlimited parking if people wanted to pay it for it in either tax dollars or parking fees so we just have to figure that out in a way that is as wise as we can and we're constantly kind of working on what that what that edge and that limit is and the last thing i'd say is i'm sorry that you live in raleigh <laughs> if you would, if you would like to come here to durham we would welcome you uh and uh there's lots of fabulous places to live here. Lots of great neighborhoods to live here in Durham, Kent. So come on over anytime. Thank you, sir, for the invitation, <laughs> Mr. Moffat. So, so Councilman Schull is exactly right, but I want to add a little bit. We we have a lot of parking. We have um, we have a lot of going on downtown. Mo a lot of people know this, but we've got many nights uh, during the summer. There are, are baseball games. There are events at the Performing Arts Center. There's uh, performances at the Carolina Theater. There are uh, free music on many nights um, through uh, an American Tobacco at Brightleaf at the CCB Plaza. And yet we have three decks at American Tobacco and three more decks uh, around downtown as well as surface parking lots. And even with all these events, it's very rare that, um, that any one of these decks is full. So there's plenty of parking. There's no excuse. Um, and once you leave your car, the atmosphere downtown is great. It's a great place to walk and um, to promenade and uh, to see all the other folks. Thanks a lot. Mr. Brown, I saw your hand or? Yes, I was just going to add a couple of things. Um, I think some of you don't want to hear this, but eventually <laughs> we're going to have uh, parking meters in downtown Durham uh, to help subsidize the, the very expense of renovating our current parking garages. Um, the, we also have a free bus system now that we instigated uh, about three years ago, which goes from Central and Duke to uh, downtown Durham as, as well as 
to uh, East Durham. Um, and then I think Steve is right. If we can encourage more bikers to come to downtown, and perhaps have more uh, parking for them in terms of bike racks. Not for motorcycles. But I'm not saying motorcycles necessarily. They're, <laughs> they're on Ninth Street, <laughs> the left bank, as we call it. But anyway, I think Don is correct. I, of all the, the problems we have, in, or challenges, I should say, that we have in Durham, finding a place to park uh, is not very high on, on our list because there usually is parking. And what's wrong with walking two or three blocks? Well, there you go. Thank you, sir. Mayor Bell, I'm going to really quickly give you the last word uh, tonight at the E Town Hall meeting concerning this last um, question that came in about the South Side Development project and what about other needs for the homeless well I, I think that's a great question also and I think I think it's important for people to realize what's involved in the South Side project uh, most people know it as Rolling Hills South Side and etc uh, what we wanted to do was to do something that would be transformative and a more on a larger scale I mean we, we did something very successfully over on Barnes Avenue where we've got Eastway Village uh, Eastway Avenue uh, about 40 houses, uh, affordable houses now, it was all low uh, income, a lot of illegal activities going on, uh, rental units, very, very few homeowners. And the city undertook to buy those uh, two blocks up, buy the houses up, and now we have a very, very quality type development. We wanted to do the same thing over in Southside in Rolling Hills. We wanted to do something that would be transformative, not just for that particular piece of property, but the surrounding area, and I think we've seen that uh, come about in terms of what's happening now South South Street. Uh, I think what's in this week we will have a sort of a ribbon cutting for the first home owners in, in that area. So looking at South Side and looking at it in the context of just it, uh, some people may think it's too much, but I think when you look at the quality product that's going to be there, not just for the people that live there, but for the city itself, it's something we're all going to be proud of. And when you look at, are we taking away from any other projects by doing this, such as the homeless? And my answer to that is no. We continue to fund those projects. And as we move from one phase, hopefully we'll be able to do more. But Southside needs to be looking at it in terms of what it will do for the city in that particular area. And I think uh, hopefully by the end of the summer, certainly by January, uh, it will be a pride of joy for all the people, not people who just live there, but the city of Durham. You can see it now. Is sort of transforming the skyline as you come into the city. And it's going to be a quality project. Uh, could you do it for, for less? Uh, probably not. Uh, could we, do we want to spend less money? You always want to spend less money, but you want to have a quality product, and that's what we wanted to continue to do. It was a very difficult site uh, to deal with. Uh, it's no question that the rain has, has really hurt us quite a bit. It's hurt a lot of construction projects, but it's going to be a quality project that's transformative that we can all be proud of. All right. Mayor Bell, thank you. And thank you, everybody, for uh, attending tonight's E-Town Hall meeting. It's been uh, helpful to council to be able to address your concerns. If your questions were not answered, make sure to check the city's website, www.durhamnc.gov, durhamnc.gov. The council will be reviewing all questions and suggestions and responses will be posted. Your continued involvement throughout the budget process is not only welcomed, but also encouraged. Stay connected via the city's Durham's uh, Facebook page, Twitter page, and on the website. All resources, documents referenced tonight regarding the budget can also be found on the city's website. Once again, thank you for coming and for caring about your local government. I now turn the meeting back over to Mayor Bell. Well, thank you, Ken. And we certainly want to applaud you and thank you for your participation. <laughs> Okay, we're going to continue the public hearing on the budget. Uh, the process is that if you have questions or comments you'd like to make, if you would go to the clerk's uh, table and sign one of these yellow cards. Meanwhile, I have about uh, nine cards that people have already signed up to speak. Uh, I'm going to ask if you, as I call your name, if you come to my right to the podium where the moderator just left. And uh, let's, let's give three minutes to each one of the persons who want to make comments on, on the budget. Uh, the first is Charlie Reese. Is Charlie Reese present? Uh, next is Steve Hopkins. Is Steve Hopkins present? 
Uh, next is Gwen Silver, uh, James O. Williams, Williams present, uh, Donald Bryson, V. Peterson, Peter Skillen, Larissa Seibel, Tevin Armstrong, and Charlie Reese had signed up already. I see it's another card. But again, this is a public hearing. Is there anyone else that would like to speak on this item that has not signed up? If so, if you go to the clerk's desk, uh, you can do so. Uh, we have a clock in front of you uh, with the three minute time limit. And if you have prepared remarks that you would like to leave with the clerk, uh, please do so. Thank you. All right, Mr. Reese. Good evening, Mayor Bell, Mayor Pro Tem Cole McFadden, members of the City Council, City Manager Bonfield, and the rest of the staff here tonight. My name is Charlie Reese. I'm here as a member of the Coordinating Committee of Durham People's Alliance. And first and foremost, uh, I want to take a moment to praise this budget uh, and all the hard work that went into putting it together. Uh, with one notable exception that I'll get to in a moment, this is a good city, a good budget for our city. You've kept our bus fares low so that those who use our public transit system to get to work can afford to continue to do so. You've kept the penny in the property tax rate for affordable housing projects so that there's a place in Durham for families of all income levels. You've maintained the tiered water rate system to promote affordability and conservation. This is a budget that is closely aligned with our community's values. Durham People's Alliance also supports the new proposal to add half cent to the property tax rate for maintenance of our public parks and trails. This is a vital measure that will keep our most well-loved and well-used public spaces in great shape. But if you think of this budget as an orchestral piece of music, there is one jarring note of discord, and that's the solid waste fee. Durham People's Alliance strongly urges you to repeal this regressive fee in favor of a small increase in the property tax rate. Like you, Durham People's Alliance is committed to keeping Durham a place where families of modest means can afford to live. Regressive measures like the solid waste fee make it that much harder for working families to make ends meet. In a time of stagnant wages, and when a great many of our neighbors here in Durham are living in or at a below the poverty line, every dollar makes a difference. The alternative, an increase in the property tax rate of about half a cent. This small increase aligns more closely with the progressive values embodied by the rest of our city budget, progressive values that are firmly held by the people of Durham. Most taxpayers, in fact, would pay less if the solid waste fee were repealed and replaced by a small property tax increase. I know that this council has been incredibly vigilant in fighting to keep Durham's property tax rate as low as possible. But all of us must acknowledge that our city has become nationally recognized as a fantastic place to live and to work, not because of our property tax rates, but because of our world-class universities, our robust business community, our outstanding public schools, our vibrant art scenes, our thriving restaurants and nightlife, even our 2013 International League champion, Durham Bulls. And yes, because of our city's commitment, our steadfast commitment to our own progressive values. None of this will be outweighed by the consequences of repealing this regressive solid waste fee. This is a good budget for Durham. Repealing the solid waste fee will make it even better, and most Durham taxpayers will pay less. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Steve Hopkins. Steve Hopkins, 105 South Benjamin. 27703. And I really just came to thank our mayor for being at the uh, Northeast Central Durham Town Hall meeting uh, along with Councilman Shaw and Councilman Davis. Uh, it surprised me that you stayed out the, the whole time, and we really do appreciate that the community thought that uh, it was important that you heard what they had to say, and you did, and you will get a report on it. And I wanted to say that I also support more sidewalks because we've been screaming about sidewalks in Northeast Central Durham for the last 20 years, and you know we're still screaming. Uh, and uh, Councilman Brown, parking meters, okay. I don't drive. Uh, next is Gwen Silver. Good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, members of the City Council, and um, administrators. It is an exciting time to be living in the city of Durham, a time of great revitalization in our downtown area. And I commend the Council for the work that you've done and for the great responsibility that you shoulder to guide this city. 
I want to highlight a couple of areas of concern and those that I hope that you will consider. Number one, parks and recreation. I hope that we can begin a discussion about ways in which they can generate more income and more revenue. We can consider, for example, how can we get programs out about parks and rec when such programs are being paid for by people who live in Durham for their children to attend camps. I have some information about the I-9 program, and I have a grandson that's taken a clinic at, at Walltown and found out from parents they didn't know that Parks and Recs offered the same programs as this I-9 camp. We want to promote the centers that we've already paid money for. Holton Center is basically a ghost facility. The walls are never dirty, the floors are spotless, and we need more to get the community involved and offer some programs and services that they can take advantage of. Collaboration. We have a District 1 resident, Ms. Lois uh, Johnson, that offered a, a sewing class that didn't get off the ground. We don't know what happened, but she was going to offer that class for free, which meant that all the participant fee would have been revenue that could have been generated for Parks and Rec. Stonehill Estates, a failed development. The last bond paid for roads. We made great in, um, increases in city streets, and they're doing well. However, we have a number of residents who have been waiting 10 years for infrastructure to be done and for paving to be done. I have a copy of one residence who at the end of the driveway, before you get to the street, there's a big pothole, which means that every day, 365 days a year, two or three times a day, they have to maneuver around the, pot, the, the pothole to even get out of their driveway. That needs to be addressed. They will wait at 10 years. Many funds have been um, appropriated for other things, but this development does need attention. Solid waste revenue. In a recent CIP meeting, I learned that the commercial division that empties the dumpsters has been discontinued. Other businesses are operating those trucks and they're operating it and they are making money. What happened that we got rid of a division that was uh, revenue generating and that's only happening? Gotta speed up. Um, we want to promote some of the things that they could be doing to bring in revenue for the city, and that's probably tying into what's going on on the state level. The Mayor's um, Poverty Initiative. Mrs. Johnson made this scarf for about a dollar. This one sells at uh, Macy's for two, $22. We're hoping that as we teach some of these classes, we can better help residents not only get a job, but how to also save money by doing things for themselves. Um, we want to move forward to implementing the new budget. Please remember Stonehill Estates and those other people who have been waiting years for decent streets. Thank you so very much. You're welcome. James O. Williams. I'd like to say good evening, Mayor and members of the City Council. I'm James O. Williams, president, well, not president, homeowners association president for Stonehill Estates. Each one of you have a packet in front of you dealing with the streets of Stonehill uh, in the last two years. The clerk itself has also photos of two, in 2012 to 2014. The situation itself, the city happened to drop the ball when it came down to the bond dealing with the developer as it, as we found out, the development went bankrupt and the city itself did not pick up the ball, want to pass everything on to the residents themselves. Uh, 451 homes in Stonehill. As it stands, I have seen in the last three months, 25 houses go up for sale, talk to the folks themselves. They are totally disgusted with the streets themselves deteriorating like they are. We get no city services, but we pay our taxes, that's for sure. Uh, the whole thing in a nutshell, I'd like for you to put this in the 2014 budget to get these streets research final surface because the streets themselves from the curb itself can be anywhere from an inch to three inches apart. And dealing with the manhole covers, uh, the plates in the street, potholes, it's really destructive. I mean, I just look at it myself. When I'm spending almost $1,000 for a set of ties dodging in and out, and other people doing the same thing, it's not fair. 
and to pass the fee itself to resurface the final surface, the streets themselves, onto the residents, that's not fair. The two biggest investments you make are your home and your automobile. When you sign on that dotted line and you walk away, everything's taken care of. This is a situation I've been dealing with since uh, September of 2007. The whole situation has been going on for the last 10 years. I would greatly appreciate it if the city itself, city council itself, would look into this deeply because we need our streets and we also need city services. When it snows, we get no services. You gotta help your neighbors get up and down the street. Uh, so far as where I live at Citrine Court in Lowestone, the truck comes down to Citrine and Lowestone, makes a U-turn and go back because of the plates in the street. It's utterly ridiculous. It really is, you know. And I would appreciate, and also all the residents, if something could be done as soon as possible. I mean, everybody else has got a raise, but we still getting stepped on. It's the whole thing in a nutshell. I greatly appreciate you listening, and I would appreciate it if you look at what the city clerk has, I mean, the clerk has over there. And another example, uh, so far as city officials, Mr. Robert Joyner, it was in 2012. This issue was supposed to have gone to the judge, I believe in Greensboro, and for determination on the situation. I called Mr. Joyner from December, January of 2013. He never responded, nor did he send me an email. And I called basically every other day, at least three days a week from the time that we were told, I was told this. So, you know, uh, I don't see what it could be so far as someone responding. The common courtesy of a phone call or email doesn't hurt anybody. Thank you. You're welcome, Mr. Williams. Uh, Donald Bryson, is that correct? Good evening, uh, City Council, uh, Mayor Bell. Thank you for the opportunity. And I want to apologize about the transparency of the budget process here in Durham. Uh, my name is Donald Bryson. I'm the Deputy State Director with Americans for Prosperity. Could you, uh, could you give your address too, please? I'm sorry. Uh, your, your address? My, well, my address, we're a statewide organization. My address is actually 424 Johnson Street, Garner, North Carolina. Uh, <laughs> But uh, we're, we're a statewide organization, and uh, I'm here on behalf of uh, the many, the hundred, several hundred activists we have actually have in the city of Durham who are concerned about the property tax increase within this budget. Um, we're an organization that uh, advocates for uh, values that we call economic freedom, and we think that a, a property tax increase uh, within this budget uh, isn't good, it actually hurts uh, economic freedom and, and increases the tax burden, obviously, on uh, citizens of Durham. Uh, our activists are very concerned about this. Uh, we think that there are other priorities that could be shifted around within the budget. Um, you know, reliance on tax incentives and other financial incentives for businesses and businesses to move into Durham uh, are a bad investment for the city and perhaps some of those that funding could be used to help shore up sidewalks in underfunded areas or socioeconomically disadvantaged areas uh, or for the Parks and Recreation Department rather than uh, increasing the property tax. Uh, it's actually harmful to property owners, and if you're looking for business owners or people to come in to Durham and buy houses in a recovering housing market, increasing the property tax doesn't make that more attractive. This morning, Durham News reported that uh, if you in implement this tax increase, uh, of the eight largest cities in North Carolina, Durham will have the second highest tax burden. Uh, that's not attractive to business owners, that's not attractive, not attractive to uh, new homeowners. Um, we think that you shouldn't go ahead with the property tax increase. And if you're about the business of revitalizing and bringing prosperity to Durham, the best way to do it would be to try to trim the fat out of the budget uh, and, and try to take care of actual, the, the base services that are needed for the city. And while you're doing a study of where pools should be, people aren't able to get around on the sidewalk and you're increasing their property taxes. Um, we think that you have a very open process for how to discuss the budget. We just think that priorities can be moved around. Thank you for your transparency and thank you for your time. You're welcome. Uh, v. Peterson. Yes, I'm Mrs. Peterson, Victoria Peterson. And you know, everyone's been thanking, uh, thanking different folks here in the city government and, and persons working on different projects. 
But today I want to give Mr. Baker a hug and a kiss and to, let, and to tell him thank you. But you haven't heard why. I think his team did an awesome job for this community. And very few of you here and those who are listening, you may not know what their team did. And I'm not going to spend all my three minutes, but I just want to share this with you. They saved this community millions and millions of dollars dealing with a lawsuit that was filed against this community. And Mr. Baker and your team, I want to say thank you to you publicly in this city council for standing up for this community that at the end and at the long run save this community again millions and millions of dollars that we could have had been made by the court system to pay a group of young men that came into this community and literally broke the law but got away with it and that's all I'm going to say about that but thank you Mr. Baker and your team. I want to uh, uh, talk a little bit about, um, again, about the crime uh, and what we really need to do in this community to address it. We have so many young men that fell through the, through the education system in this community. And for whatever reason, years ago, somebody came into this community and traversed them and encouraged them to sell drugs to make money. When young men and women do not have skills and talents and they cannot get a job, they start, start getting involved in deviant behavior. Because a lot of times what happens, our kids fall through the cracks and my time is moving, going real quick, quick here. I would like the city council to bring in some individuals to create a training program, an ongoing local training program that our young men get a stipend over a two to three year period. They receive a stipend every two weeks as long as they're in school, they're being trained for a job, and also a job has hired them. That company cannot pay them fully, but the company can half pay them and the city can kick in the other half. That would give a lot of, of our young men who are caught up in the criminal justice system, a lot of the young men who are out stealing, they're breaking in folks' houses because they do not have the finances and the skills that they need to take care of themselves and their family, Mr. Mayor. That would really have, a, have an effect on the poverty in this community, and thank you very much. Uh, Peter Skillen. Hi, I'm Peter Skiller, and I'm a resident at 2615 Indian Trail. Um, I'm also representing Reinvestment Partners as Executive Director at 110 East Gear Street. Uh, we're a nonprofit advocacy and community development agency working for economic justice. Uh, we work for the betterment of people, places, and policy that serve those people and places. And I've come today to talk particularly about the policy of sidewalks and investments. Uh, we've invested about with the city's help about 1.5 million dollars into the East Gear Street North Roxborough corridor for commercial and residential redevelopment as well as providing a number of human services and one of our biggest challenges is having the sidewalks uh, repaired uh, we've put in about ten thousand dollars ourselves into sidewalk repair um, sidewalks help our transportation for low-income residents who don't have cars sidewalks are important for compliance with Americans with Disabilities Act Sidewalks provide a quality of life. They show that there's investment. Uh, they're a safety issue for pedestrians. Um, <clears throat> as I work in the neighborhood, we've taken on crime, uh, we've taken on disinvestment, we've taken on blights, we've taken on the very large banks and their walkaways from some of their properties. Uh, but sidewalks are the ones where I see families not able to get their strollers and their children up the sidewalk. I see people in wheelchairs riding up North Roxborough Road, one of our busiest streets, rather than being on the sidewalks. And I see uh, our businesses not being able to prosper because of this tore up sidewalks. And it's one of the harder challenges, actually, to get the city uh, to invest in. And so I 
have taken many of you on the tour of the neighborhood, and I've talked to many of you about sidewalks, and I know you know it's a priority. I know you know it's important uh, and what a worthwhile investment is. That's not what I need to convince you of. Um, I think that if we frame the issue of we have way too many sidewalks, we can't fix all of them, um, then we have a, we frame the problem as one we can't solve. I do think if we frame it as how could we cut the wait time from more than three years in half, that's a problem we can solve by simply increasing the budget by $100,000, because that's about what you're currently putting into it. I think the second policy solution is, is that we need to be more targeted around how we spend those funds. Currently, it's just a chronological list of when you put your name on, on it. But some sidewalks are serving our economic redevelopment functions. We're trying to bring neighborhoods back. Or we have an ADA complaint. Or we have a broader strategy that we need to think about. So I would ask the council to move on a reoccurring basis, move the budget up to $200,000, and we will cut that wait time in half. Two, we need a better management policy around how we prioritize those repairs. Finally, I want to thank the Public Works Department. The gentleman who's in charge of sidewalk repairs takes his job seriously with great integrity. He's brought new technologies to the problem. He's reduced the per square foot cost. The city's got a good strategy, got a good program staff in place. It just needs a little more money with a little more target. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, Larissa Seibel, former city council person. Thank you. And I know how hard it is to balance this budget. But um, we do, uh, we are here with a petition with 65 signatures that's being passed around. There's plenty of copies because I know it's not just city council, but the city manager and his staff who uh, have responsibility for finding those funds to repair our sidewalks, and we hope that you will do so. Um, we did not have to convince anyone to sign these petitions, that uh, people um, had stories to tell about the unsafe sidewalks, some of them right in front of their homes. And uh, several people told me about neighbors who had been injured uh, because of sidewalks that were uneven and they tripped and fell. One woman sprained her ankle so badly that she was out of work for three weeks and, of course, didn't receive paychecks for three weeks. Uh, the city did come out and inspect the place where the accident happened. Uh, the neighbors are hoping the city will be back soon to repair these uh, sidewalks. They are uh, clearly a hazard to anyone who walks on the 1200 block of Roxborough Street. When I went out there, I could see that some of the sidewalks were lifted at least four inches from trees that are no longer even there. So it had been qu quite a while. You couldn't even see the stumps or the roots or anything uh, since the uh, sidewalks had been um, in that condition. And one lady, I, I sat with her a couple times, and she told me that uh, she had called um, more than three years. So we're in conversation with our neighbors, and they're hoping that you can come out soon, and I would be happy to uh, get you that address, whoever you can point me to, to um, try to get that on your priority list. Thank you for your attention. Welcome. Uh, Linda, could you get a microphone? Uh, next is uh, Tevin Armstrong. I'm, I'm okay. You okay? Yeah, I have one good left. So um, I want to say I am using a wheelchair, but I have one good leg. Uh, Tevin Armstrong? Yes, Tevin correct? Armstrong, sorry. Um, I wanted to talk about the sidewalks and uh, that the fact I use a wheelchair um, and I have one good leg. So me riding up in the sidewalk, which I do often, um, I could use my one good leg I have to lift up my wheelchair to go over those cracks and bumps, but whereas other people who are in a different condition than I am can't. And it will be very difficult as the lady in the video today um, that, that y'all showed in the, on, the, on the monitor. And uh, it was very hard for her and she eventually had to roll in the street, which is very dangerous. So um, I just would like to say that, you know, if there is some way that you could fix sidewalks for people who who are very who, who makes it very difficult and they have to you know even before i had my operation i saw people riding in the streets all the time especially in my neighborhood where i used to live um 
and uh, they ride in the streets always, and they, they have problems going up hills, and it's very difficult, you know. So, you know, anything just to smooth it out for them, and, you know, um, I think it'll be a lot easier on people and um, make everyone just a little bit happier, you know. Just even though there are more problems at state, you know, that everyone has to deal with, and uh, I know you guys are very busy. You know, the city council is very busy. And uh, I'm not here to jump down your throats and say what you guys, you know, because as I say, it's better you don't know what goes on unless you're behind that counter, behind that register, or behind, you know, the desk. So, you know, um, I'm sure that you, you're working very hard to do what you can. And, um, but I just, I just think that we should, you know, take into, take into thought that some things may be on a higher priority than other things. And, and I wanted also to say that um, with the little time I have left, I wanted to say um, there are some things to work with with the youth, like Ms. Victoria saying, and also piggybacking off Ms. Lady right here. I didn't catch her name, but you know, um, it is money to pay people to fix things and to pay workers. And if we could get people more involved from the communities to come out and do things themselves, you know, would be would help out a lot and cut down on a lot of money, so people won't have to work. So you know, you won't have to worry about putting in budget for you know, workers and materials and stuff like that. I mean, you're gonna need materials, but, you know, I think you kinda catch what I'm trying to say, but, you know, I just wanna thank you for you know, letting me talk and speak and uh, hope that I've made an impact on, you know, on you guys' decision. So, thank you. Okay. Tevin, I forgot that you were sitting back there. He was on our youth commission. Yeah. And uh, we really appreciate a young voice Thank you. tonight. And Mr. Armstrong, what's your address? Oh, uh, I live, my mailing address is 923 East Main Street. I do not have an address, a permanent address yet. Um, I was recently homeless, but I'm working on that. But 923 East Main Street, if you want to send something to me, um, if you want my phone number, I can Go ahead and, you know, all right, cool. I, I have it on the card here. I can pass it okay. to you. Okay, yeah, so okay. just give me a call. Uh, I, I do look forward to helping out in the community soon. Uh, I'm, I've been helping out in the community a lot. A lot of people can witness to that. And uh, I like working with the youth. So um, anything I could do, if y'all want to call, y'all need a, somebody to work for your program or run one of your youth programs, give me a call. I would love to do it. And uh, you know, I'll be around, and hopefully you'll see me up there sitting right next to one of y'all one day. <laughs> so, thank you. Okay, that concludes all the persons that had signed up to speak for the public hearing on the budget. Is anyone else that would like to speak that has not spoken? If not, let the record reflect no one else has to speak on the public hearing for the budget. Uh, I will close the public hearing and entertain a motion to receive the comments. I so move, Mr. Second. Been properly moved and second. Any further discussion? I had recognize something Councilman I Shule to say. and represent Council the Mayor Pro Tem in that order. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, that was. It's always great to hear from somebody who's in that exact situation that everybody is talking about, kind of abstractly. So, Tevin, thank you for being here and saying that. Uh, I did want to make a few comments about a couple of things that were said. I, I think one thing that, that we ought to, to tell the folks here and the folks who have written us about sidewalks, and it is such an important concern, that uh, I wish uh, for this reason that Councilwoman Katati is here, because she is a real sidewalk champion, as, as, as folks may know. And one of the things she did bring up at our last work session is to try to figure out how we do reprioritize our sidewalk funds. And uh, the city manager is... Uh, looking at that and, and they will be bringing, the staff will be bringing something back to us about how to prioritize our sidewalk funds. Uh, we haven't added any, uh, but uh, I th you're, you're, you're the, for the folks that would like us to do that, uh, I think in future years that's something we should definitely be looking at and I really appreciate you raising it. Um, the, um, the gentleman here from Garner, I, I, I'm sorry he's not still here, but I did want to say that 
The tax burden in Durham is certainly not keeping any businesses out of Durham. Uh, Durham is filling up with businesses that want to come and live here. They're pouring into Durham. Our, our economy is growing tremendously. And in addition, when you add the water rates in, and other, other fees from other communities, Durham is right in the middle of the pack of North Carolina cities. And finally, just thinking about his comments about taxes in general, I, I just wanted to mention some of the things that taxes do in Durham. Nobody likes to pay taxes. When we raise taxes in the city, I have to pay them too, and I don't like paying them any more than anyone else does. But when I think about some of the things that taxes do, our, our building inspectors last year reviewed 2,700 development plans. By the way, that's how many businesses want to be in Durham. They re, we had 90,000 electrical and mechanical inspections in Durham last year, 90,000, 90% 90 of them done within 24 hours. That's what our tax money does. We had 9,600 customers come to the planning department for something that they needed. Our tax money paid for serving them. We, remo we removed 650 tons of junk and debris, 650 tons. City staff did that. Your tax dollars paid for that. We removed 500 gra sites of graffiti. We have 516 police officers on the street, 516 uniformed police officers. And they clear crimes in Durham at a much higher rate than the national average. Your tax dollars pay for that. Taxes are necessary for some of the most critical things that we have. We have 1,500 city vehicles, whether they be police cars or solid waste trucks. We have a fleet department that has to service them. We repaired, people talked about potholes. Our city staff last year repaired 1,800 potholes. That's your tax dollars at work. We had 8,000, we repaired last year, this is by the way about sidewalks, we repaired last year 8,000 feet of sidewalks last year. We flushed 64,000 feet of stormwater pipe. We picked up recycling from 71,000 households, 14,000 tons of recycling. Your tax dollars at work. And I should have mentioned this when we talked about downtown and how to make less parking need downtown. We had 22,000 people a day ride our data buses. There's federal money in that. There's people paying the, the fee when they get on the bus, but your city money, your city taxes is helping to support that. When you get clean, safe water out of your tap every day, our city fees, in that case, are paying for it, 25 million gallons a day. So paying for the city is paying taxes. Is, it's not paying for nothing. It's paying for these absolutely critical services that we need. No one likes to pay more. I know I don't. But I do want to say that the idea that taxes are just something that are that's, 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 uh, that, that is unnecessary somehow, we just should never raise them and shouldn't have them, I just think needs to be countered with the idea of all the amazing things that our city staff is doing, and we can only pay for it through taxes. So we're making a decision each time, each time we make a budget, about which of those services are essential and which we can do without. But I did want to put that out there, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Steve, uh, very well spoken. Needed to be said. Recognize the Mayor Pro Tem. I merely wanted to thank um, all of our staff, budget, finance, everyone for the important role you all have played in helping to shape uh, this budget. We have 24 plus, 2,400 plus employees who do an outstanding job, and we need to tell you that more. Uh, you are the experts, and under the leadership of an outstanding leader, Mr. Thomas Bonfield, who just celebrated a birthday uh, on Friday. I already <laughs> sang happy birthday to him, so that won't be necessary. But we applaud you Thank for you. hanging in here with the city, and we hope that your morale will continue to be high. And if we're doing anything to uh, make that uh, not happen, 
let me know. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Recognize the mayor. Councilman Mark. Thank you. Um, and it should be noted that it's not just an outstanding budget process, it's an award-winning budget process. They do a great job. But I want to thank um, also uh, all of the people who came here tonight to speak, who've been looking at the budget um, as lay people. Um, I know how difficult, it's, it's a complex budget. People have really dug into it. And I've talked to people on the street who've come up to me who clearly understand have been looking at it and pouring through it. And I really appreciate all of that participation that our staff makes possible, but that the citizens take advantage of. The, the uh, Partners Against Crime meetings that people came to, to uh, the, the coffees with council that began this process earlier this year, the first hearing that we held, and all of the other intervening uh, opportunities people have taken advantage of. Thank you all. Uh, before I call the question, I, I think it's important, in addition to what's, what's already been said, uh, that the public understand where we go from here. Uh, it is in the of this council to adopt a final budget at our June 16th uh, city council meeting. Uh, in between, we'll still have some more meetings to discuss what we've heard tonight, certainly, and uh, some of the other issues that have been raised uh, before we meet, make a final decision. But the uh, goal is to adopt a budget our June 16th Monday meeting at the City Council meeting. Uh, having said that, I'm called call the question, ask the clerk if she'll open the vote. Close the vote. It passes six to zero. Thank you. Uh, let's move to the next item in the agenda, which is item 3030, 30, which is the 2013 evaluation assessment report of the Durham Comprehensive Plan, A14 000002. They're not all staying for this. <laughs> I, I shouldn't be insulted by everybody leaving the room, huh? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Aaron Kane with the Planning Department. I'll give a brief report on this item. Case A1400002, the 2013 Evaluation and Assessment Report of the Durham Conference of Plan. Uh, there are three parts of the EAR that are before you tonight. Uh, that are usually before you for a decision. First is rectification of any changes to the future land use map that was made by the Durham County Board of Commissioners. The second are policy changes uh, to the text of the Durham Comprehensive Plan. And the third are technical changes to the future land use map regarding things like changes in floodplain or um, conservation or agricultural easements that have been acquired. Uh, there were no uh, future land use map changes adopted by the Board of County Commissioners in 2013, so you have nothing to rectify there. There are 54 policies of the Durham Conference of Plan before you that have either been edited, uh, removed, or are newly created policies. We ask that you adopt those as part of this. There are also three parcels that are proposed to change future land use designations as part of the technical changes. Uh, two of them would be uh, change to agricultural because of agricultural easements that have been acquired, and one is an open space change because of an open space easement that was acquired. All of those were in the county's jurisdiction. However, we ask you to also adopt those so that we have a uh, common future land use map. Staff is recommending approval of all three aspects of the EAR. Planning Commission recommended approval on a 12 to 0 vote at its April 8, 2014 meeting. And the Board of County Commissioners adopted all aspects of the EAR at its May 27, 2014 meeting. I'll be happy to answer any questions if you have them. Thank you. This is a public hearing. Uh, the public hearing is open. You've heard the staff recommendation report. I would ask first, are there questions by members of the council? Uh, if not, it's a public hearing. Is anyone in the audience that would like to speak on this item? Uh, let the record reflect that no one in the audience asked to speak. I would encourage the public hearing to be closed. Madam Speaker, for the council. Yeah. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes six to zero. Thank you. We move to item 31, street closing of an unnamed alley, perpendicular to alley number 12, S street closing 14000005. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of Council, Pat Young with the Planning Department. Um, first, I'd like to quickly certify for the record that all public hearing items before you tonight, including the previous item, uh, have been advertised in accordance with the provisions of law. 
and uh, we have affidavits to that effect on file with the planning department. <laughs> the Ex post facto. <laughs> it's the best I can do. I can't do it in my sleep, though. So I'm so I'm told. Um, the uh, street closing before you is 14000005. It's a uh, Joanne Darby uh, requested to close a 50 linear fit portion of an unnamed alley off of Alley 12, which is immediately east of Buchanan Boulevard and uh, south of Urban Avenue. The right of way is currently open and the portion requested to be closed to border by the applicant's property and property owned by Barini Properties uh, to the east, or excuse me, to the west. If the request is approved, the right of way will be equally divided and recombined with the adjacent properties. Uh, city and county staff, along with utility service providers, have reviewed this request and identified no adverse impacts. Uh, thank you. I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, you're welcome. This is a public hearing. The public hearing is open. You've heard the staff report. Uh, again, would ask are there any comments from members of the council? Recognize Councilman Moffitt. I just have one question. I have one question, which is um, given that it's a sh short alley, why not close the entire alley? Well, the uh, the applicant chose to only get uh, the rec um, required signatures from the adjacent property owner. They would have had to go go and collect the signatures from the other abutters. Uh, I believe there's only two other properties, but um, the end that she's requesting closure of is a terminal end uh, and wouldn't affect access to anybody else's property. So. Um, she, she could have, but she just chose to get it from her directly abutting neighbor to the to her rear. Pardon, pardon, pardon me, ma'am. Do you want to speak on the side? If you can come to the podium, please, and state your name and address. As she's coming forth, do we have any other comments from other, any other council members? Thank you. I'm Joanna Darby, 705 Watt Street. I'm the party in question. Um, to answer your question, Mr. Moffitt, about cl not closing the other two thirds of the alley to the south of us, it's an unopened, uncity maintained paper alley. However, the um, four houses um, whose homes back up to that alley immediately south to me um, have paved and maintained it. Um, for umpteen years themselves. And for me to request that the entire alley would be closed would be to deny them access to their own garages and nullify whatever expense they've gone to. All right, thanks. Thank you. Again, it's a public hearing. Is anyone else that wants to speak on this item? Uh, let the record reflect that no one else asked to speak. I would declare the public hearing to be closed. Matter of fact, the council. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes six to zero. Uh, item 32 is the street closing of Chaparral Drive, street closing 13000005. Thank you again, Mr. Mayor, members of Council, Pat Young again with the Planning Department. Uh, case SC 13000005 is a request by Hendrick Automotive Group to uh, close a 1,090 linear foot portion of Chaparral Drive, which is located just west of Fayetteville Road and south of Renaissance Parkway. The right of way is currently open. Uh, the portion of requested for closure is bordered by the applicant's property and property owned by South Point Mall. Uh, if the request is approved, the right of way would be equally divided and recombined with the adjacent pro uh, properties. The action is requested to facilitate development of the adjacent property uh, for automat automotive sales use. Uh, city and county staff, along with utility service providers, have reviewed this request and have not identified any adverse impacts. Um, thank you. You'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. You've heard the staff report. It's a public hearing. Are there questions by members of the staff council? Uh, if not, is anyone in the public that wants to speak on this item? Uh, let the record reflect that no one in the public has to speak. I would have a public hearing to be closed. Matter of fact, for the council. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, we open the vote. Close the vote. It passes six to zero. Uh, the final item is the supplemental item, item 35, resolution memorializing Dr. Mao Angelo. Uh, we entertain a motion on this yeah, item. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes six to zero. Uh, 
I see the city attorney. Oh, you're gonna go get that kiss and hug. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> let us know. Let us know when that's scheduled, please. Okay. <laughs> please let us know. Okay. Any other items to come before the council? If not, the meeting's adjourned at 9 p.m. Thank you.